Good. So glad to be here. The previous talk is really sort of perfect for me uh, because I think it gives a sense of what you can get out of data in terms of understanding your world and for helping governments uh, to be able to do a better job. You have to know what's going on to be able to figure out what to do. Um, now, 15 years ago, uh, year 2000, uh, a commonly heard thing was half of the world had never made a phone call. And that was the year that the UN set up its Millennium Development Goals, 15-year goals that end this year, to be able to reduce poverty, infant mortality, inequality of various sorts, genocide. And um, we've gone through that. And as you heard in the last talk, progress has been made on lots of these things. Perhaps the biggest thing that's happened, though, in the last 15 years is this. 80% of people, including kids, own a phone now. And that number is going to go up to 95 over the next 10 years. Everybody. Everybody is digitally connected to everybody else in the entire world. But also, those phones are sensors. You know, you have to ping the cell tower to know where, where you are so that it can send you the messages and so forth. Even the poorest communities take phones because with a phone you can earn more money. And so we've entered a really interesting time when new capabilities are coming to us that are just completely amazing. Everybody is blasé. We, you know, we use ways to navigate around. Uber comes and picks us up. We know all sorts of things about our immediate environment and, and can manipulate them in ways that 10 years ago, even, would have been considered completely crazy or would have been thought to be really expensive. And now they're mostly free for that advertising stuff, right? It's pretty amazing. Um, and what my group and others have been doing is sort of studying what's happening with this. Where is it going? What are some of the big changes? And one of the things we discovered is, I think, really shocking. We look at the pattern of interaction in communities. We don't look at particular people. We ask, for a community, do they talk to themselves? Do they talk to the rest of society? Do they explore and talk to different people? Do they talk to the same people over and over again? Things like that. And what we've found is that you can say the essence of a community. Most of the things that we think about, is it creative? Is it, is it scary? Is it healthy and growing? Is it poor and, and, and falling down? Can be seen in the pattern of interaction between the people. Because it's not the technology that matters. It's the people. And it's the ideas flowing between people that differentiate one community from another. But now take that and turn that around. What that means is that if we can look at the pattern of interaction through phone calls, or through cars driving around, or bikes driving around, or through credit cards, or government records, it doesn't really matter. There's lots of digital breadcrumbs in our lives today that let you say something about how a community interacts with itself and with the rest of the society around it. From those breadcrumbs, it turns out, you can identify the poverty level of a community. You can find pockets of poverty. You can find places where infant mortality is high. It's really quite amazing, because the pattern of communication seems to be what determines these things. It's not really the education level. It's not really you know, the regulatory environment. It's the human interactions that seem to matter most. So you can find places that are Poor, you can actually map out an entire country's poverty levels. Like, for instance, we got data from the Ivory Coast. They had a, a, a revolution not so while ago, civil war. So they don't have any census data or anything. But you can look at things like cell tower records and figure out which towns are poor and which ones are rich. And it's cheap to do. It costs pennies. That means you can get a real-time census. The sort of data Max was talking about is painful. You need brilliant guys like Max to be able to get that data in the past. But now, 
you can begin reading some of this stuff out almost in real time. You can also see which communities, which neighborhoods are likely to be sources of innovation because they communicate better. You can see which neighborhoods are likely to be places where there's a lot of crime. It turns out that neighborhoods where there's not much mixing between different communities are places where you get more crime. And you, we never knew this. We had lots of theories about it, but we didn't know it until we began to have these sort of digital breadcrumbs that let us look at the actual patterns of interaction. You can also look at places that are likely to undergo growth, economic growth, other sorts of growth. And that's amazing. So this is something that um, the Secretary General of the UN calls the data revolution. And what it is, is something that is really the first time in the history of the world we actually have the ability to have a picture of what's happening in the world. So from time immemorial, you could have a plague that would decimate a large part of the rural population. And the capital city wouldn't hear about it until it was all done. A warlord could go crazy and, and start slaughtering people. Nobody knew, right? But now, because this technology is everywhere, we have little digital breadcrumbs we can pick up. And we can see it happening. So like the Ebola plague that happened. They didn't make use of the digital breadcrumbs, but they could have. And the next time that happens, they're going to. They were deeply embarrassed that they didn't track the spread of Ebola as it happened. Why? Because the systems hadn't been put in place to do that. But the technical reality is now you can get the sort of information that Max was talking about everywhere in the world, every neighborhood, for not a lot of money. It just takes us organizing ourselves. Late last year, I was on a committee for the Secretary General talking about these things. And the result of that was a resolution that every country in the world will begin mapping this stuff in more or less real time continuously using these sorts of methods. I was voted on two weeks ago in the General Assembly. All 193 member countries are obligated to have their national statistical offices report the sorts of data that Max was talking about and more. Things about violence, things about inequality, things about quality of life, things about disease, more or less continuously. And so for the first time, you can imagine a world where there's real transparency and accountability for how well government policies are working out, for how well development aid is working. It's almost impossible to imagine. We're so used to things being cloudy, opaque, and corrupt that it's hard to imagine a world that counts. But we seem to be heading in that way. Of course, along with all this data that could give us not only convenience, but also transparency, accountability, better government, a world that actually counts every human in it and, and begins to take care of them. There's also the bad side. The bad side is, is that there are hackers, there are corrupt politicians, there are immoral companies that steal data and do things with it. And a lot of people worry about that. Telefonica has an index that goes around and asks every country in the world what people think about this. And they find that, well, a lot of people are OK with this world we're moving towards. There's a lot of people that are scared. About 25% are really deeply skeptical that the good things will happen and still worry that the bad things will happen. And I think typically in an audience like this, it's a lot more than 25%. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I think we need to go for the good stuff. But we need to be cautious, too. We need to do our homework. And so what I've done along with uh, the Mozilla Foundation, the uh, uh, Open Data Institute here in the UK, Telefonica, set up something called the Data Transparency Lab. And with a gift from Telefonica and later other organizations, we give money to researchers to figure out what happens to your data. Because while we know we can do all these things, 
and we know we get convenience from our data, you don't actually know what happens to your data. I don't know what happens. Nobody knows. That's wrong. Data is powerful. Data is valuable. We don't know where it's going. We got to find out. So that's what we're doing. We have our first conference in November 16 and 17 at the MIT Media Lab. Welcome to join us. Registration is free. It's a nice place. Um, and we'll begin to find out what's happening to your data. Thank you. Whenever I talk about data on a stage, there's always a question about privacy. And it's always from somebody who's over 30. Really? And I'm kind of aware that there's a strong interest in people preserving access to their personal data from a very small number of well-financed tech companies that seem to increasingly own it. But why do you think there isn't a critical mass of interest in taking action to reclaim that data from those private companies? Well, first of all, I find that it's the youngest people who are the most passionate about it. But they often feel like there's nothing they can do. So maybe it's the older people that are vocal, right? <laughs> but the younger people are sitting there and stewing. And that's what the Telefonica thing shows, too. Um, I think the big thing is, is people don't see what they can do about it. And, of course, they don't know what's actually happening. It's all rumor, and I heard this. So the Transparency Lab is to find out what actually are the facts, right? And we do that by commissioning scientists to go out and study it and figure out what's happening, because people won't tell you straight up. So, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, um, you know, that you often heard, the internet was designed without a security level. Well, so at MIT, one of my big projects is developing that security level so that you can know that your data goes where you want it to and nowhere else, and even the NSA can't get at it. So if you're interested in that, the project's called Enigma, enigma.media.mit.edu. I'm signing up. Thank you for traveling okay. from Boston. Sandy my Penland. My pleasure. Thank you.